Thank you for being with us. So let's talk about Operation Save America. <clears throat> the Holy Spirit pours out. We welcome you that are here with us. We welcome you that are following online. Let's get started. Several weeks back, I was at Springfield Camp Meeting and was approached by a fellow pastor who asked, the normal pastor question, how's the church doing? They don't ask you how the wife's doing or the husband's doing, huh? They, or, uh, you know, how are you doing? They just says, how's the church doing? By their reaction, my answer was different than they expected. I said, on Sunday morning, we show up at 1000 Brown Avenue, and the Holy Spirit shows off and shows out. <clears throat> In a nation that is far adrift from God, how could churches, how could Christian organizations possibly conceive Operation Save America? One day, and I pray soon, we show up, and instead of the Holy Spirit just showing off and showing out, I am praying that he pours out. And in his pouring out, there will be such an unprecedented move of heaven that a spiritual awakening will spread across this community, across our country, reviving Christians, saving sinners, reinstating righteousness and reinstituting our nation's founding moral landscape. That is my prayer. Realistically, we have to be realistic. Realistically, is that possible? Pragmatically, is that feasible? And, and honestly, is that probable? So for the next few weeks... Let's talk about why that we can realistically, honestly, fervently pray for, confidently wait on, diligently work toward, and expectantly anticipate an outpouring of the Holy Spirit. Here we go. Number one, the Holy Spirit's pouring out is the Father's promise. And so for the next few weeks, we're going to talk about how is it that we honestly, realistically, pragmatically, probably, conceivably think that we can save America? One is the Holy Spirit uh, pouring out is the Father's promise. Hear the word of the Lord. If you love me, obey my commandments, Jesus says, and I'll ask the Father and he'll give you another comforter an, or another advocate, some translation says who will never leave you. He is the Holy Spirit who leads into all truth. The world cannot receive him because it isn't looking for him and it doesn't recognize him. So if you're expecting our world, if you're expecting our culture to encourage you in this, uh, don't. They're not looking for him. And if they were, they wouldn't recognize him when he comes when he shows up, when he pours out. <clears throat> because um, the Holy who leads in truth, the world cannot receive him because he, they ain't looking for him and doesn't recognize him. But you know him. If you've been born again, turn to your neighbor and say, I know the Holy Spirit. Because he lives with you now and later will be in you. No, I will not abandon you as orphans. I will come to you. Jesus is speaking of his leaving and the Holy Spirit's coming. And he's saying the Holy Spirit is going to come and do basically in them what Jesus did when he was with them, what he did for them when he was with them. He assures them the Holy Spirit will show up and they will not be orphans. They will not be abandoned. 
Jesus says the Holy Spirit will show out. He will lead you into all truth, and he will show off. As the disciples recognize him, he'll show off to you. As the disciples recognize him, <clears throat> but the world does not recognize him. As I said, don't be surprised if, when you talk about Operation Save America, if people look at you as if you have two heads and a brain and neither. You see, you recognize the Holy Spirit as the force at work in Christians that will save America. Yet they don't and they can't recognize him. But you can. And this is why we have to lead. Amen. This is why the church has to step forward. It's because we recognize, we're aware, we know a source that can, in a snap of a finger, change our culture. The Holy Spirit was promised to the disciples the last few weeks Jesus was with them. But as the crucifixion of Christ was accomplished, the resurrection has happened. The ascension of Jesus is moments away. And it is here that we have an amendment to the Father's promise. Listen to it. Acts chapter 1, beginning with verse 4. And being assembled together with them, he commanded them not to depart from Jerusalem but to wait for the promise of the Father, there it is, which he said, you have heard from me, for John baptized you with water, but you shall be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. Luke chapter 24, 49. Behold, I send the promise of my Father upon you, but tarry in Jerusalem until you are endued or clothed with power from on high. So this group travels about three quarters of a mile from the Mount of Olives to the upper room in Jerusalem. It is safe to say that there is some intense conversation between the eleven as they walk less than a mile. They have repeatedly heard Jesus Remind them of your mission is to go and change the world. They were familiar with the Father's promise. But when Jesus dropped it in on them, it's going to happen in just a few days. Heads spin. Hearts throb. Questions ask. And now they're going to the upper room to process. You've heard talk about the Holy Spirit's outpouring. But to consider it might happen in a few days demands we pause and process. So let's talk about how this promise, the Father's promise, came to a room full of gospel misfits and riffraff. And as we look at them, let's think about ourselves. So here we go. They knew the history they had with each other, this 120. And once they got, meaning this 11, once they got to the upper room with the other 109, they knew there was going to be some come to Jesus meetings. Now let me just tell you all something. We're gonna have to have some come to Jesus meetings Probably before we're going to have much of an outpouring of the Holy Spirit. So they knew that. I'm sure they had discovered the profound truth about communicating the gospel after being with Jesus three years. And here sums it up. Nothing significant can happen through us until something profound happens in us. So what were these 120 doing for 10 days while waiting in the upper room? The obvious answer, they were praying and they were planning for Judas's replacement. As you read Acts 1, you know that. But Lloyd Ogilvy points out what might not be so obvious. Here we go. Listen to what he says. This was a profound time of reconciling relationships. Approximately 53 days prior to this moment, they were to lead a world-changing. They were told they had to lead a world-changing campaign. And they were everything but ready. 
There had been firm competition among them, and no doubt the residue of criticism was lingering in the upper room. Peter had denied the Lord. Thomas had doubted. Brothers James and John were jockeying for the top spot in the kingdom. There was bad blood between Jesus' family and the disciples because Jesus supposedly, because of his emotional condition, remember they, they cast, he was casting out demons and, and there, was a, there was a lot of uh, propagation, there was a lot of accusations that, that says he has a demon in him. And it is in that setting that his family comes to rescue him, take him to Nazareth. And it is believed that the disciples strongly objected. So the disciples and Jesus' family wasn't getting along real good. Amen. Anybody in here like that? No, no, don't say nothing. Don't say nothing. Then added to the mix were the people that Jesus had forgiven and restored that no good Jew could tolerate. It is doubtful the disciples had ever worked through their true feelings about a person like Mary Magdalene, the prostitute. Always before Jesus was present to cushion the sharp edges of their prejudice and bias. How did they really feel about the Pharisee Nicodemus? He was a member of the Sanhedrin and yet he did not stop what they had done to their Lord. He was a part of of that crowd that voted to crucify him or led for the crowd to crucify him. And what about the rich Joseph of Amarthea? He provided the tomb for Jesus. Would that not make him, in some respects, a crucifixion accomplice? Besides, he was rich, and based on what was said about the rich, could you trust him? Knowing the state of the mind of the disciples, I'd say they put most of that crowd on suspicion alert. In other words, they were not only skeptical of Joseph of Arimathea and Nicodemus, they had their doubts about most of those that was in that group. How many in this room have you put on suspicion alert? Oh, I don't know about you. Uh huh? I don't know about you neither, huh? Let me just tell you, and I want you to hear this. It is believed the disciples, the 11 disciples stayed in the upper room. So, so uh, uh, Ogilvy suggests that the disciples pretty much stayed there for 10 days while the other group, the rest of those that made up the 120, they, that crowd, they kind of came and went. So when this started, when this gathering started, it was everything but the church standing around, loving on each other, arm in arm, singing Kumbaya. Come on, amen. I'm telling you, they was a bunch of gospel misfits and riffraff replacements. What are you trying to say, Pastor? I'm just trying to let you know. You may not think that we are ready for Operation Save America. And if you look at us, we are not. <clears throat> but I heard about a promise. <laughs> I heard about a promise that the Father gave to his children. This strange mix of humanity that was initially gathered in the upper room filled with fears and doubts and questions and broken relationships, skepticism and suspicion, each having their own reason for being there. I've used many times Robert Coleman's description of the 12 uh, that Jesus called when he started. And keep in mind, 11 of them was in this room. 11 of them was a part of this gathering. And hear Robert Coleman as he describes the 12 disciples. These men do not impress you as being key men. None of them occupied prominent places in the synagogue, nor did any of them belong to Levitical priesthood. 
For the most part, they were common laboring men, probably with no professional training beyond the rudiments of the knowledge necessary for their vocation. Perhaps a few of them came from families with considerable means, such as the sons of Zebedee, but none of them would be considered wealthy. They had no academic degrees in the arts and the philosophy of their day, like Christ. Their formal education consisted only of synagogue schools. Most of them were raised in poor sections of the region around Galilee. Apparently, the only one who came from a more refined region of Judea was Judas. By any standard, he says, of sophisticated culture, then or now, they would be considered a rather aggregation of souls. <clears throat> One might wonder how Jesus could have ever used them to change the world. But he did, and they did. They were impulsive, temperamental, easily offended, had all the prejudice of their environment. They were not the group that one would expect to win the world. And while they may have improved a little over three years of being with Jesus... They were still a far cry from being ready to succeed in changing the world for Jesus Christ. I don't want you to look around and see who you are and see who you worship with and size up whether or not we can pull off Operation Save America. I want you and I to ponder on the Father's promise. Because if you look at what is beside you, and if you've looked around at what is behind you, and, and if you look ahead at what is in front of you, <laughs> oh, you're going to say, oh, Jesus, help us. He's talking about saving America, and who's going to save us? Ah, don't, 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 don't just look around you. But I want you to look above you. And I want you to hear the Father's promise. When the Holy Spirit is poured out upon you, you shall have power to be witnesses of me throughout this world. They needed so much changing in their own world. How are they going to change the world? Nothing significant can happen through us until something profound has happened to us. We need so much changing in our own world. How are we going to change the world? But may we, not, may we dare not forget, they gathered with a promise. And so have we, as a bunch of gospel misfit replacements who are not even first string riffraff. Come on, amen. And each of us come this morning with our own reason for being in this room on this day. But I want you to notice something about these disciples, something about this 120 they had a common loyalty to Christ in their heart. And they all had a promise of the Holy Spirit pouring out on their mind. They heard it. They heard it. They had reheard it. They had spoken it. And they had spoken it again. So over several days of coming and going, preaching, praying, and reconciling, Luke assures us they were not only together in the same place, they had arrived now with a common objective. Ten days, that's what some thinks how long they lasted, that the, the, the upper room experience was before the pouring out on Pentecost, uh, be that as it may. But, but there were some things that began to happen in those ten days. They were united in the Father's purpose in the ministry plan and the pursuit of the mission. And when this amazing, unbelievable unity of believers was evident, the Holy Spirit poured out and we historically call that day Pentecost. 
There was a few more than 120 in this room. One might wonder how Jesus could ever use this group of second string gospel misfits and riffraff replacements to save America. We're impulsive, temperamental, moody, easily offended. And we have all of the prejudice of our day. We're not the group that one would expect to change the world for Christ. There is so much in our own world that needs changing. How can we change the world? Because we understand now nothing significant can happen through us until something profound has happened to us. So what about? What about the white folks accused with their era of superiority. White folks get accused with their era of superiority. And what about black folks accused of playing the race card? Some blame the Hispanics for coming to America, taking the jobs and getting a free ride. Now, I told you we're going to have to have some come to Jesus meetings. So I'm just going to give it a shot at moderating one of those. <laughs> If there's any refereeing needs to be done, we have a good godly security team. What about the, some, of the, some, some blame the Hispanics for coming to America and taking the job, and the Hispanics retaliate. If you lazy Americans would work, we wouldn't take your jobs. Don't criticize us. We're in your fields picking your vegetables so you can have something to eat. The poor are skeptical of the rich. Suggesting that you got rich by being a crook. And the rich judge the poor as being slothful and shiftless. The older generation is suspicious of the young, and the young is standoffish to the elderly. He has a Pentecostal background, and his way of worship is way too loud, and he is much too enthusiastic. She is orthodox and high church. She's too quiet, dry, and stoic. She has a wall that is full of degrees, and he has many holes in his ability to speak the English. One family arrives in the church parking lot in a sleek, shiny BMW, while another rolls out of a mud-covered, jacked-up 4 by 4 And the beamers are praying the truck doesn't park close because I don't want your mud near my shiny sleek beamer. We, for several reasons, find it convenient of being jealous of one another. Some of us joyfully sing and pray as we speak to Jesus, but we haven't spoken to one another in months. One votes prime. Oh, <laughs> y'all are going to love this. <laughs> And to thank you pay me to sit around and think of this stuff. Don't you want a refund? One votes primarily for Democrats and the other votes mainly for Republicans. The conservatives in their politics honestly wonder, how can you be liberal and be a Christian? And the liberal ask, how can the conservatives call themselves Christians being more passionate about getting Donald in the White House than you are in getting Jesus in your neighbor's house? A few is King James only. Another segment is not so rigid on translation, yet the, key, the KJV questioned the other's salvation for even reading another translation. One group with both hands held high shouting the song choruses for the fifth time, while another group declares the Church of God hymnal was good enough for Paul and Peter and bless God, it's good enough for me. Well, now that didn't go over as well, did it? <laughs> oh, you all like that Donald deal a lot better than you did that one, huh? I'm just trying to tell you, 
Folks, put us together, and we are a colossal mess. And you think we can save the world? You, you think we can pull off Operation Save America? <laughs> well, I'll tell you what. We don't have something in our back pocket. This thing ain't going to get off the ground. Amen? Oh, we're too, we, we, just, we, just, we just are too, we're too far out. We're too far off. Whatever, whatever terms you want to use in, 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 in play in that. And so, but know this. Hey, I've took a few jabs at you, but I'm going to take an equal jab at me. You got this guy called a shepherd of the church that's gotten old and achy and slow and senile. And he's not even sure he can lead this church on such a mission. He wonders if he can't do a better job kissing grandbabies than he can pastoring a church. And he believes kissing grandbabies would be a lot more fun. Again, I ain't jabbing you without jabbing me. And you think 120 or 220 or, or 250, whatever's in the building today, do you think that people like us is ready for Operation Save America? We look at each other and wonder who's going to save us, much less can we save our country. But I don't want you to lose heart as the game comes. Don't lose heart. We have an ace in our pocket. I got an ace in my pocket. You got an ace in your pocket. Don't you lose heart as you look around you. <laughs> As you look beside you, as you look behind you, as you look in front, don't you lose heart. And the ace that is in our pocket is the Father's promise. The Holy Spirit is going to pour out upon you, and you shall receive power to become witnesses of me in Judea, Samaria, uh, into the uttermost parts of the earth, Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the uttermost parts of the earth. In other words, and of course, we probably already know this, we probably already know this, but the word power is where we get our English word, dynamite. <laughs> and that is true. So I want you to turn to your neighbor and say to your neighbor, the promise that I have in my pocket is dynamite. <laughs> but don't take cover just yet. Don't, don't take cover just yet. Okay. And here we are, praying, reflecting. Over the next few weeks, we're going to pray, we're going to reflect, we're going to confess, we're going to repent, we're going to reconcile, we're going to have some come to Jesus meetings with our brothers and sisters in the church and our neighbors outside the church. Now listen up and listen closely. We just might get there with a promise in our pocket because I want you to know something. If you're a Christian, I do believe, I do believe you have and I have enough loyalty to Jesus Christ that will unite us as our differences dwarf that divide us. Can I just tell you? I believe you have something in you that is going to work. And it's called the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit is going to start working in me. And he's going to start working in you. And as he begins to work, 
we're going to realize, I don't care if you're white, red, black, blue, or yellow. It matters not. I don't care that Hispanics has come and, and gotten jock. I don't care. Welcome to America. Huh? Amen. I don't care if you vote Democrat. Come on, amen. I don't care if you vote Republican. Amen. I, I don't care if you roll in in a four by four jacked up, mud covered, rusty bucket of boats that's got Chevrolet across the back of it. <laughs> Give me a hug, Marty. Give me a hug. <laughs> it doesn't matter if you're 18 and got more tats on you than, than I do hair on my head. Come on. It doesn't matter. Because you see, there's something that is happening. And I'm telling you, if this Tommy Rot stuff that divides us, if who we are in Jesus is not uniting us, well, I'm going to tell you, some of us need to get here quick and figure out who we are in Jesus real fast. We have a mission, and it's called Operation Save America. And there's one thing that matters most. Oh, I'm not saying your preference of, I'm not saying that things don't matter. Come on, amen. But I'm just saying when we come through those doors and we're on mission for Jesus Christ, there's one thing matters and it matters most to fall so deeply and madly in love with Jesus Christ that the Holy Spirit works in us and we have the power to take Jesus and show Jesus to our world. That's what matters. Give me a little something, something, something on that organ. Oh, yeah! That's what matters. And what a shame. We have taken a beautiful thing called the Holy Spirit. And we have tried so hard to fit it into our historical tradition. Misty. And we have a statement of faith that we can make about him. Come on now. Come on now. Or we can dot the I's and cross the T's in a statement of faith that we can make about him. But beloved, when it comes for me to have the power, the dynamite that gives me the ability that takes me beyond myself and above myself and gets me out of myself. Oh, come on, I'm telling you the Holy Spirit. Let me just tell you, you're going to see these disciples that was a aggregation of souls become a mighty army. You're going to see some guys that were scared to death of a few Jews Get in the face of national leaders and declare Jesus. That the Holy Spirit. And I want to just tell you all, me being loud don't make him no more powerful. It's just me. Okay? It's just me. So maybe if you're stoic and quiet, I ain't gonna I ain't gonna talk about you. Amen. So you shut up and leave me alone if I get loud. <laughs> Amen. Just, just me. Just I don't, I don't even know if you blend. It's the way I'm wired. I knew that I knew this was the way I was wired when I went to my brother's, uh, to my brother's first. He, 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 first football game. I was chaplain of the Morgan County Cougars. And I went to my brother's first, my little brother's first football game. And so I was chaplain. And, and so I was remotely familiar with some of the plays. And, and, and so I'm standing on the sideline and, 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 I'm, and you know, I'm watching the game. And, and, and I, remember, I remember they called this play and I recognized it. 
It's a play where my brother, who's a wide receiver, where he goes, he goes down the side and, uh, and he cuts across. I don't know. It, it, was, it was one of those plays. Uh, Riley knows about it. Carter knows about it. Who else in here plays football, huh? Anybody else in here played football? Okay, you all know about it. So he goes down. So he goes down. I knew it was his. And he caught the ball. And he scored a touchdown. And we all come back to the sideline. And the head coach, Bruce Herdman, said, Pastor, you beat your brother to the end zone. I knew. <laughs> now, now I, I, I wouldn't even bother to get out of the chair, but, but you know. <laughs> but, but that was 40 years ago. Uh, and and I, let me just tell you, folks, we're wired different. Come on. We're wired different. And what a shame that your unique wiring that God fearfully and wonderfully made you, what a shame that the devil has used that to divide us. And I'm telling you, it's because the Holy Spirit has been put on the back burner in our lives. Because as the Holy Spirit churns, as he works, as he mixes, as he mingles, as he, as he pricks, as, as he cuts, as he works, that which divides you from others begins to dwarf and your loyalty and your love for Jesus begins to unite you. How are we pulling this off? I got a promise in my pocket. So do you. Probably pocket's not a good place for it, but, but I got a promise. I'm, I'm, I'm leaning on a promise. And so are you. And maybe today, maybe today you just want to come. They're going to sing, come on, gang. You just want to come. And you want to surrender. To the power, to the dynamite, to the Holy Spirit. And that he can get you out of yourself. And get you beyond yourself. And get you bigger than yourself. Come on, amen. Come on. Amen. That can, that can take you places you don't even know that exist. That can, that can do with you things that you didn't even know that could be done. That's what the Holy Spirit can do when we are surrendered to him. It's interesting. It's interesting 10 days with 120. Oh, I'll tell you what. You hang 10 days with 120 Christians, you better be getting full of the Holy Ghost. Amen? 10 days. Or that's what some say. 120. Let me just tell you something. Yes, it climaxed. Listen up. It climaxed in a glorious manifestation of God the day of Pentecost fully came but I am here to tell you from historians and just from things that we know and, and from, from the history and I mentioned those today I, I, I'm going to tell you I think there was some red faces there might have been some quite intense moments of fellowship among that group turn to your neighbor and say, thank God we don't have a problem that God can't work out in us and through us. In Jesus' name, Father, do a work in our midst. You know what you're up to. Do a work in our midst. Lord, I just confess to you, I just confess to you as one who has been so privileged to be this church's shepherd. I just confess to you, I did not just jab them. Oh, I jabbed them, Lord, because you're in the jabbing business. You're gonna, you're gonna mess us up before you straighten us out. We gotta see who we are and what we got going on. We gotta be real with that and honest with that. And so, Lord, I didn't just jab them, I jabbed me. 
And I'm not just praying for them, but I'm praying for me. Mr. Brown, pray for these elders. Pray for these leaders, ministry leaders. Oh God, oh God. Mess us up. In the name of Jesus. I don't want you to stand, but I want you to come and pray. 